five, four, three, two, one. And we are officially on the air for the first episode of the Battling Basic podcast. So this is a special moment because it's the first episode. It's also a special moment because we got a special guest on today. We got our boy here, Corey Jarvis, 2016 Olympian, top eight finisher, 2014 Commonwealth Games champion. Corey, man, how's it going? It's going good, man. It's going good. <laughs> Thanks for having me out this morning. No worries, man. So, like, Corey's a colleague of mine I look up to very much, so I thought, man, like, this is the, this guy's got an awesome story. This is, like, the perfect guy to have on the first podcast. Corey, man, so, like, tell us a little bit about yourself, like, where you grew up, uh, how you got into the sport of freestyle wrestling, and kind of, like, how you got to the point where you are now. I know that's a big question, but... <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Though. A lot of people ask it, and I've told it a lot of times, so I kind of I know the basics on this one. Um, yeah, I'm from a really small town in uh, Ontario, northern Ontario. It's called Elliott Lake, and um, that's where I grew up. A lot of... I uh, was never really into organized sports or sports when I was younger. There's a lot of... Uh, a lot of woods, wooded areas and trails and lakes and stuff where I'm from. So my brother and I were always outside with friends, just being kids in the woods, building building stuff and swimming, hiking, all this all this crazy stuff the kids do. So I wasn't really involved in uh, organized sports and uh, until I was uh, the, at the age of 14. And my one of my best friends that I grew up with, he said that I should try wrestling. Because he had tried it the year before, and he, he loved it, and he was having some success at it. So I came out, and I did a couple practices, and I was I was kind of timid at first, and I didn't really know what to do, and I was, like, almost the same weight as I am now, and uh, Seriously? A, a foot shorter, so... You so when, when you were in the woods, were the bears afraid of you, or were you... No, no, I, I didn't look like this when I was younger, <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, so then I started, I started, uh, I started loving it, and then started training more and training more. And it was so basic back then because um, the people that were training me, they were they were not high level athletes either. Like coaches wrestled in high school and this and that in Northern Ontario. No one, no one was at like a level that we are now, right? So it was, it I loved it, and mm-hmm. I didn't know what I was learning, but I was learning something, right? And then. Um, and then it came time for the first tournament, the first competition, and then it went out. And you can imagine um, in high school when, when you're wrestling, I'm, a, I'm in grade 9 and, and I'm in the, the 95 kilo weight class, so there's not too many grade 9s in that weight class. So I'm, I'm going up against grade 11s and grade 12s. And Jeez. I'm getting my butt kicked every single time I step on the mat. And uh, my, first, my, first, uh, my, first whole, my first season of wrestling was uh was zero points scored <laughs> so it was it was a bad season no yeah so like I, and you think that i would be like so discouraged and i would quit right Damn. but um i didn't quit at all um i came back the next year and we didn't have a we didn't have a high school team so we weren't we weren't like off so wasn't our thing because we didn't have a high school team we just had a club but we had like provincial championships was was a big thing for us and uh the next year after I started convincing my coach to, um, so since we weren't involved in school, we could, we could train through the summer. So I convinced my coach that we should start training more and we should open a kids program. And I started helping out with the kids program and like just to kind of build the club in, in our city. And our city is only a population of like 9,000 people. So it's limited amount of wrestlers and a limited amount of talent. But um, we started training more. And then uh, it came came time for the the provincial champions that next that next uh, that next year, and I ended up winning the provincial championships. Oh uh, no way! Yeah, so I went from not scoring any points to training harder, and then winning the provincial championships. And I went I went out to Calgary that year, and wrestled the Cadet Juvenile Nationals, and again got my butt kicked so bad, Damn. and I just it was it was an experience, right? I never experienced that team aspect. Of, going on a big trip and t- and flying there and getting that whole experience when uh, it's different yeah yeah and it's different and then obviously taking the loss but I wasn't like I kind of brushed it off I was like oh, okay these guys are these guys are better than me they're stronger than me yeah and then started like doing a little bit of weights and training more and then 
my high school career kind of took off and had some uh, had some good success, winning a couple more provincial championships and finishing like top three of the nationals, which is like a big deal for a kid from Elliott Lake. A lot of people were like, "Oh my gosh, this is crazy." Yeah. And then it, it uh, I was one of the top ranked guys leaving high school, and uh, Guelph approached me, Doug Cox, and um, so. I was like, yeah, I'd love to come to Guelph. I went to, I, I had applied to school in Conestoga, which is it had a campus in Guelph, so I was kind of set up and went there. Moved, moved everything like seven hours south, and yeah. Uh, yeah, my parents dropped me off, and it was like, okay, and then I was just there and just kind of figured my own way out and started training with the club, and it was awesome because it was like you're every day you're going to practice. So you probably imagine too, like when you when you came here from your high school club or. Um, you were just learning new things every day, right? Yeah. The, the coaches are just the next level, and the partners you have are next level too, right? Exactly. So when I came into the room, I was I was the bottom of the totem pole, and uh, there was a lot of big guys at Guelph at that time, and our club was big, and our university team was good, and yeah, I was just like daily getting my butt kicked, but it wasn't like, it wasn't get my butt kicked because I wasn't a good wrestler. It was get my butt kicked because like the guys in the room were better, and that's what you need, right, when at that level. Mm-hmm. And there was just lots more opportunities for uh, – like side things besides just training on the mat there were so many workouts like people were doing like oh like come come to this workout come do stair workout yeah. with us come do sprint with us so it was just trying to get as many as those in and and it just started like snowballing it just started getting better and better and better and then I uh was on the national team before I even knew it and then um top three in the country top two in the country and then I had a, I had a decent break when I um I got to go to the Commonwealth Games in 2010 uh, the number one guy at the Where time. Where was that in India? It was in India, yeah. Okay. So the number one guy at the time uh, decided he didn't want to go, and they last minute they called me up and they're like, "Corey, you want to go to India to wrestle the Commonwealth Games?" And I was like, Jeez. "For sure!" And it was like, "Get some vaccines." Yeah, in me. <laughs> yeah I, didn't, I didn't even right. I just like they're like, "We'll try to get you a visa. And we'll we'll get you on a plane." You didn't Can get you... a vaccine? No. I'm what? Like, hard as fuck like that. <laughs> what the. Fuck, man. I come back like 70 kilos <laughs> yeah so they they called me on a friday and then my coach was like Corey, you want to go and i was like for sure i want to go it's a crazy opportunity how could you say no right yeah, yeah yeah and um they're like can you make weight and it was it was in october so so you wrestled 96 kilos at the time yeah it was 96 kilos okay. at the time yeah so i i was probably sitting around 106 kilos and they're like Damn. they're like can it's Friday and they're like, oh, you're going to fly out Monday and you have to weigh in like three days later. And I was like, okay, let's do this. Oh so I just like started cutting weight. And it was a kind of like off season at that time. And uh, like the season was just starting up. So we just had the summer and, you know, we get that summer weight going. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I, I got out there and just, it was the hardest weight cut of my career probably. Damn. And I remember me and Evan McDonald were like, just in India, it's not hard to sweat, but you're like running around and you're wrestling, and it's just oh, it was it was a mess, and we both both had so a hard 10 time. Ten kilos in like under a, a week. Yeah, it was like a couple, it was like probably five days, Holy and like shit. you lose like a full day of traveling too, and like a, it's like fourteen hours of traveling and ten hour time change. So Man. you get there and just it was good. Like I I was pumped because I was there, and like a bunch of my buddies were on the team, and it was awesome. And uh, go out there and make the weight, and I wrestled. I ended up losing in the finals. Uh, it's like a close match to a guy from um, Nigeria. Uh, I could say I kind of got screwed by the refs, but I kind of got screwed by myself, anyways. I let him score on me in the last little, uh, the last twenty seconds. So yeah. it was, it was a bit of a heartbreak, but it was also a good win. So it kind of established my, me as an athlete, saying that like, yeah, I've been on these international circuits, and I've, uh, I've won some medals, and then. We did uh we did the the tournaments in Spain and and uh, France and Italy and all those and I started like racking up some medals and and then uh, one of my big downfalls was in two thousand twelve when uh, I didn't I didn't qualify the um, I didn't win the trials the Olympic trials at at um, freestyles I lost I got third I lost to a guy from BC uh, Manjot is that that was in ninety six yeah yeah there was again in ninety six kilos. And that's like I thought I was I was so ready for the trials at freestyle and that's what I prepared for and I was I was preparing to beat the number one guy that's what my goal was right I was gonna I was gonna beat the the number one guy and yeah. I beat him before but it's not when it counted 
So I, I trained, I just trained to beat him. That's it. I was training to beat him. I knew exactly what he was going to do. I knew how to beat him. And then I, uh, I didn't even make it to him. I lost, I lost to, to really? the, you, you know how the trials work, like the ladder. I lost, I was number two at the time and I lost to the guy that got third and just. Yeah. So for those listening for the Olympic trials, pretty much the year before at senior nationals, whoever places top three is placed on a ladder then at Olympic trials, you have to win a pool tournament. And then if you win that, you got to beat the number three, then the number two, and then the number one in a best two out of three. So it's pretty tough. So you lost to the number three, was it? Yeah. So, so you I, won the pool tournament? No, I, I was the number two on the ladder. And okay. um, the guy that came through the pool was uh, Ali Arakabi. And he, he lost to uh, Manjot Zahoda. And then Manjot and I wrestled for to see who would make the finals. And we uh, it's just one match, right? So I lost to... Um, I lost to Manjot, and then he went on to uh, lose to the number one guy. So, like, what do you think of scouting then? Do you not like it and stuff? I do, I do like scouting, but um, the way – obviously, you have to know your opponents. Obviously, you have to know what your what they do and how they do it in their defenses and their offenses. But you also have to in, – in my mind, I, I just try to – I train to beat everyone now. So, I just train to be the best. I got to okay. – I know my – Offense is gonna is gonna beat anyone mm-hmm. if I if I take my office and bring it my offense out there and bring it as hard as I can. So that's what I that's what I train for now. I, obviously, you have to know your opponents, and if you don't know your opponents, then you're not doing something right. Yeah. But you have to also like train your hardest, and you can't train to beat one person because you don't know if you're gonna wrestle that person in a day. You, you could wrestle anyone, right? Anything happens. So that's where I was at, and uh, it was pretty big heartbreak to uh, to lose to to man job because I had beat him at the nationals before and I was ready to uh I was ready to win the trials and make the Olympic team in 2012 but instead of uh freestyle I, I took the Greco route in oh, 2012 seriously? so yeah I went back the next day and I won the Greco trials and then I went on to um I went on to the qualifier and I had a sponsor that sponsored all my uh my Greco trips because it's un it's unfunded in Canada right so yeah. So for those listening, freestyle is like the main style of wrestling in Canada, and then Greco is also another style. It's big in certain other countries, but in Canada, it's not too big right now. Um, but yeah, so um, it's unfunded. So yeah, so you got a, co- a company yeah. to sponsor yeah, you. Yeah, so my the the company my dad works for, he they uh, they sponsored me and they they paid for my training and my trips okay. for Greco. So that was that was fortunate because I wouldn't have been I would have been able to, but it would have been tough. So. I went down to um, the Olympic qualifier in Kissimmee, Florida, huh. and as you know, like at the Pan Am qualifier, you need to you have to place top two, and you make the Olympic team, right? So had a good draw. Um, U.S. and Cuba were on the other side. That's all you can ask for at the yeah. Pan Ams, right? You can't ask. Those for guys anything. are killers, man. Yeah, I had a, I had a great draw. Obviously, I don't train Greco full time, but. I can hold my own. I've been I've been wrestling for so long, and I've I've done a lot of upper body stuff. And I did after the after the trials, I did train with a Greco guy and trained full time Greco for a few months. So I was ready, and then uh, I'm in the semifinals, and I win the match. I go to the Olympics. If I lose the match, I'm not going to the Olympics. So I'm wrestling yeah. a guy from uh, was it Venezuela. And That's a tough country, man. Yeah, he's yeah. A, he was a big jack dude, like full like Greco his whole career, uh, very strong athlete. And the rules change all the time in Greco. It's it's hard to explain. But back back then, two thousand twelve, there was a rule if if you were passive or even after no, it was it was like a minute or two minutes into the match, one person would have to go down. So at the at the first one, the blue blue rest would go down after the first period, and you have thirty seconds to score. And if you didn't score, the blue person got a point. Okay. And then in the second round, the red wrestler starts on parterre. If there's no, it was it was like a the clinch basically. Yeah. But it was parterre. So there's some so, subjective input. Yeah. From so like, like the ref, if kind. no one if no one had scored in the first two minutes, they automatically start parterre. And if there's no score within thirty seconds, the offense or the defensive wrestler scores or yeah gets a point. Okay. So first round, go down. Um, he um. He ends up turning me, and then I end up taking him out of bounds, I think. So it was 2-1. We go, we go to the second period, and uh, they put him down. No score in the second period. Um, all I have to do is there, I have 30 seconds to score, right? This yeah. the last 30 seconds of the match. I got 30 seconds to score, and I go to the Olympics. And um, 
Man, that's intense. Yeah, I know. So I was like, I was so ready too. So I get the gut wrench on. I'm driving as hard as I can, <laughs> and I like I pop him over as the time goes out, and like referee puts up two points. I jump up. I'm like, awesome. Yeah. Going to the Olympics. They're like, they throw the challenge block in, and they review it, and they're like, no, the time no. was up. So yeah. And the ref held it up. Yeah, it was like the points were on the score on the board, and I was like, okay, I got my ticket. I'm going. Damn. And then. Uh, yeah, it was, like, intense. I was, like, holy shit, like, how did this happen? And obviously, I, like, break down. I'm, like, whatever. Shitty deal. Yeah. Um, like, I'm pissed because, obviously, you, like, you think of, like, the last 12 years of your life. Like, this is what you've put in. Like, this is why we're doing it, right? We're not, how old were you at the time? Um, five years ago, I'd have been 26. Okay. So, and that's, like, that could be, like, the end of someone's career at 26, right? You never yeah. know, right? So no, for many it would. Mm-hmm. For many it would, yeah. So I, I go back. I wrestle. I get third. Obviously, I'm upset with it. You got to get top two. Um, so yeah, that guy booked his ticket to the Olympics, and uh, yeah, I didn't. And then uh, yeah, it was it was a heartbreaker. It's the it's the worst when you see someone actually like celebrate and they think they've won, and then the refs go back and reverse the decision. It's one thing to screw someone in the match, yeah, yeah. but like once you're like, you're like, you feel that rush of emotion and then like they just go in and reverse the decision. It's just like, and, are you serious? Like, yeah, and, the, and that was the rules, right? Like everyone gets screwed over. Like, I don't know if people were saying, oh, I watched it online and you scored. There was like three seconds left, but like the delays on the, the time, who knows, right? Like, I don't know when I'm not going to like spend the rest of my life like, oh my gosh, I should have went, I should have went, and it ruined my life, but I obviously I took some time, and I was, I needed to like, get away from the sport, so I was like, focusing on my family, and focusing on that at that time, so I took like, probably four months like, off wrestling, didn't do anything, and I was like, I don't know if I want to come back, like, I don't know if I want to put four more years into this, so, uh, and obviously you did came back yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah that's, that's like everyone Man, knows I, you know what yeah. I, I like I, I've seen you go like I've seen the build up to 2016 you rode to Rio but I had I actually had no idea any of this happened it's crazy because people see the the, the highlight of you going to 2016 mm-hmm. placing top 8 but they don't see any of this shit yeah like, they don't look to the third place guy at the Pan Am qualifier yeah <laughs> in 2012 like they look at the top 2 guys like yeah it's and, and, and for wrestlers, it's hard, right? Because you, you have your own story and you have your own path, right? So everyone's trying to, you're trying to get your path, right? You're trying to make that, that team and you're trying to make that world team, that Olympic team. And uh, yeah, so right after that, I was, I was like heartbroken and I was like, okay, I'm going to come back. I started coming to practice, messing around. And then it was right before the, the Canada Cup. And you, you know, the Canada Cup's in Guelph, so it was local. So it was, my coaches were like, oh, why don't you wrestle heavyweight and try it out? I'm like... I trained like literally two weeks in the last four months and I didn't cut weight and I was, I wasn't heavy or like super heavy. Like the weight class was 125 kilos at that, 120 kilos at that time. And I was sitting around 108 kilos and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll wrestle it. And, uh, the draw comes out and uh, my coach is like, oh, you have Sonny Dinza first match. And he's the national champion at that time. Young guy, big guy, yeah. good wrestler. Yeah, for and those listening, Sonny Dinza was like the reigning heavyweight champ at that time. He was like pretty dominant within Canada and mm-hmm. stuff. So like, like he was probably two time, three time champ at that time. Junior, like junior world medalist. Yeah, um, yeah. he yeah. got like bronze right at the world. Yeah, he was yeah. a bronze medalist, and yeah, so he was he was a good athlete. This is my first match back in four months, and then I go out and I beat I beat Sonny Dinza first match. Damn. And. Uh, or my coach comes to me, he's like, maybe you should think about a weight class change. <laughs> like, maybe if you're coming back, like, maybe this is it. And then, yeah, that was it. Like, I wrestled that, I wrestled that match. And then that was, uh, that was, like, set my four years up. I, I hadn't lost the national championships since then. Five no more cutting weight. No more cutting weight. <laughs> Happy guy all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, that basically set it up and then just kind of snowballed from there. Like, won the nationals, my first national championships. Um, you beat Sonny Dinza yeah, again. Yeah, I, I beat Sonny again. I went through again, and then uh, Sonny had kind of retired at that time. He moved on to the WWE. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so he's he's having a good future there. And um, so, yeah, then I, I just – it snowballed. I just started winning tournaments. And like you said before, like uh, did, did the Commonwealth Games, won those, did the Pan Ams, got silver, and started hitting the world circuit. Uh, with I didn't have some great success at the Worlds, and then uh, until the Olympics, I 
Uh, but the the four years leading up to the Olympics, I was I was uh, I was working full time. I had a family, had a mortgage, forty five hours a week. Like I was at a at a man. At a that's shop. something I wanted to ask you. Like, how do you balance that? You're a father too, mm-hmm. and and you're like an athlete. How do you balance all that, man? That's yeah. Insane. It was it was there was some like a lot of tough days. Like I was my boss was amazing where I uh, where I was working. He gave me so much flexibility. Um, I would work out like I was. I was getting up at five, going to do my weights in the morning, a couple times a week, and I would come in. I would come in late, and uh, he would be okay with that. He's like, "Come in when you want." Like obviously, I was. I was working hard when I was there. He's not gonna let some uh, Joe Schmo guy that's like half asleep, not working, yeah. get all this freedom, right? So he understood my situation. He understood that like as athletes, we only have this one chance. We only have. A, we can only do it when we're young at this sport. I can't come back like when I'm forty or fifty. Say okay, I'm gonna try to make the Olympic team now. It's it's now or never, right? Yeah. So he understood that. And shout out to Corey's manager. <laughs> <laughs> but he understood that. Um, that's what it's about, right? Like, yeah. It's about now. It's about that was my passion. That was my dream to make the Olympic team. And then I put in those hard work. I put in that hard work, but I was still working full time and training full time. And like you said, I have I have a daughter and I'm a father and. There's there's a million things that like could stress you out, right? But I uh I went through and I uh I won the trials for um for freestyle and I won the tri- trials for for Greco and Shit. um the options now. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted I wanted to make the Olympic team bad, right? And obviously everyone does in our in our in our position. So I went down to uh to Florida, not Florida, sorry, Texas again and it was the Pan Am qualifier. And again, US USA was uh USA was on the other side, but Cuba was on my side. So obviously, you have a, you have a decent draw, but it's not terrible. And uh, the guy that um, the Cuban got beat by another guy, and I wrestled uh, the Colombian in the semifinals. So and, did Colombia beat Cuba? Yeah, Colombia beat Cuba. Okay. And then I'm wrestling uh, the Colombian in the semifinals at the 2016 uh, Pan Am qualifier, so the Olympics, mm-hmm. and. He's a good wrestler. I wrestled him before, and yeah, we're wrestling hard. And obviously, like a lot's on the line right now, right? You've and, been in that position. Yeah, before. I've been on that position before, and I'm nervous as heck. And first round goes. I think I think it was one nothing up to the first round for him, or for me, sorry. And then uh, I remember I just like shot in, and he tried to body lock me, and I just like kind of went to the side and put him right on his back, and uh, I remember just being on top of him and like got in a position to like pin him and I squeezed him as hard as I possibly could. I'm like, this guy's never getting off his back. <laughs> and it was like, it was the most intense moment because like I knew if he stays on his back, I'm going to the Olympics and I squeezed him so hard. And I remember just the ref like hitting the mat and I'm just like jumped up and just like, damn, let all, all that emotion, you know what I mean? And like, you've seen me wrestle and I'm a pretty emotional guy. Like when I get a good victory and there's some, there's been some photos out there of me celebrating pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> there's been some good ones. So yeah, I guess, again the same thing. I like, got up and like the team was there and our women's team was there and they they had just qualified all six weight classes and they're yeah, watching yeah, the stands yeah. and it was a pretty intense moment. And then obviously go on to the Olympics and I uh, I had a tough draw at the Olympics, but uh, I I finished I I was happy with my finish. Obviously, you man, you had Iran and Georgia on the same side, right? Yeah, so I had, that, that's I had, a tough draw, I man. Lost to, uh, I lost to I lost to Iran first with a five lost him five two, and he went on to get a silver medal, and then I I won my next match, and then I lost to um, Georgia seven two. Because he, who's he's a reigning world champ, yeah, by he's the a way. Reigning world champ, and he went on to get a bronze medal. So it is what it is, but. Um, yeah, then it just it just keeps on going. Like after before the Olympics, people were like, "Oh, are you gonna are you gonna quit? Or are you gonna retire after uh, the Olympics? Or are you gonna keep going?" And I'm like, I'm not even thinking about what's gonna happen. I'm thinking about that day. Like, yeah, just being that present. August twentieth, like that's my day, right? I gotta put it all on the mat there, and I, and I did. I I my I gave uh I told my boss after I qualified, I'm like, I need to train full time, and I had some support from people, and I got the I got the support I needed to make sure my life was sustainable right i gotta make sure my bills are covered and i gotta make sure my i'm not putting myself in debt for this sport oh fair enough yeah yeah and that's you gotta do it smart right i can i can go to debt i can go in debt and try to but that's not gonna help me wrestle better it's gonna be something it's always gonna be back in my mind right i don't want to be stressed i want to be training full-time focused i had a great support team leading up i took that four months before the olympics and just trained as hard as i could i had a good result and i felt awesome 
even though I didn't place in the top three, which I wanted to, I still had a great time. You you had some good wins too, though. Like you like dominated um, Egypt, right? Yeah. And who else was it? That was the only one I, I wrestled at the. At, I only won one match at the Olympics. Okay. So, okay. but um, yeah, I had a good run, and then right after I, I got some funding and snowballing more. I could just, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going for the next three years, and that's my plan. So. Man, that's awesome, man! And then you just actually wrestled the 2017 Worlds in Paris, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. And uh, you had a top eight finish there as well. Yeah, seventh place. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Like uh, you had some, uh, you had a good win against. Uh, I actually, wrestled the Egypt guy again. The same guy wrestled the Olympics, and then I wrestled uh, a guy from um, I can't even remember the country. Uh, I'm drawing a blank right now. Whatever, man. But, yeah. You're just kicking ass. Uh, but yeah, regardless of what uh, country it is, that's that's good. And then I I I did. I was happy with the finish of Worlds, but I knew if. Um, if things were a little bit different, I couldn't. I had a couple injuries leading up this year that I couldn't train as the 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 way I wanted to, mm-hmm. and I'm still dealing with some of those right now. But um, yeah, if I would have trained a little bit different, I think I could have t- cracked the top three just because I felt the kid was there. Like I saw the path, and I lost the Georgian again, which he's world champ right now, and he's he's kind of like at his peak right now. He's just killing everyone. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, I feel like I could have, I could have got cracked top three if I just would have did a couple things different. Pre- pre- well, man, like at your level, right? It's like it's not even about probably acquiring any more skill or anything. You're like at the level you need to be. It's more so about like how you peak and like the periodization leading up to it, how you manage your injuries and stuff, right? So it's just yeah, like, it's it's a big on preparation and mental game is big. You gotta be. It's like as you know, like you're out there. I I wrestled uh, f- uh, four matches and. If I would have won them, I would have had five matches to get bronze, right? And that's not an easy day. It's it's quick day and it goes fast. Yeah, so they're right after each gotta, other, right? You got to be prepared. You got to be prepared for five matches in a day, like five toughest matches of your life, right? Yeah. So it's a lot of mental and staying staying focused for that day. And it is all one day right now, and it might it it's supposed to be changing to two day, but still, it's it, the the main part of it. It's one day. Like you have to be ready on that day. Yeah. 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 No, for sure, man. Uh, like, it's tough, man, because it's just, like, it's not even, like, five matches. It's five, like, wars, man. Like, these guys are not messing around. They're the best in their country. There's, like, 30 countries out there. It's not like in Canada where you might get a guy who's not that tough first match and then another guy that's not that tough second match and then maybe a kind of tough match third match and then maybe the finals will be tough. It's like every single match is, like, a grinder, oh, yeah, right? For sure, 100%. And that's the, way, like, that's the way I think about it. I'm like, okay... I've got six minutes of war right now. Like, that's all I think about, right? Going out for that, like, you don't worry about who you got next. You're not, like, I know what you're saying in Canada. Sometimes you're like, okay, I know this guy. I've wrestled this guy. Like, yeah, I know what I'm going to do. And then you kind of almost focus on the second guy before you even beat this guy. But these ones are, like, you got to focus on that match at that time and just think about six minutes of war. And you, like I said before, you have to know your opponents. And most of the guys at the Worlds, like, you're going to know them. You're going to have seen them on the World Circuit. You're gonna kind of know their name, and your coaches will know their name, and mm-hmm. seen matches of theirs before. So yeah, you gotta take that match at a time. Okay, occasionally, there's like some random like guy from the slums of like Western Russia that you've never <laughs> seen in your life, who's just like a like a freak. But like yeah. other than that, it's yeah, like, yeah, it happens good. sometimes. Yeah, you get those people <laughs> that come out of nowhere and just murder everyone. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, anyways, yeah, talk to me about like your experience at the Olympics, like. Others than just competing, how was, like, the overall experience? How was it, like, because, man, you're from a small town, right? So, like, I, like, on social media, I saw, like, how, like, everyone got behind you because, like, man, it's, pro- it's probably, like, non-existent that someone from a small town goes to the Olympics and, like, you know, how everyone got behind you. How was, like, the opening and closing ceremony and stuff? Like, like how describe to me the experience. Yeah, um, I, I, was, I was lucky because there is... Obviously, I was the only one that was re- representing uh, the at the uh, representing Canada the Olympics from my town. Like you go to some other towns, you go to Vancouver, Toronto, Guelph, Kitchener, Hamilton, and you get like three or four or five people like from that area that are going right. And so the whole focus isn't on them. And I did have a big focus from my hometown on me, and I had like an enormous amount of support. There was people, like, knocking down the door wanting to help me out. And so many local businesses were, were helping me out and sponsoring me. And, Man, that's awesome. And it was great, right? Because that's, that's what it's about, right? Like, it's, I, didn't, I didn't make it there just because I was a good wrestler. I had, I had good support. And 
I had good coaches and good training partners, and it, it all comes together. You have to you have to be a team. It's only an individual sport, but you have to be out there and you have to team Jarvis. Yeah, team Jarvis, <laughs> man, it's growing all the time. So yeah, I had a great amount of support from my uh, my hometown and my family and my friends, and obviously uh, Canada Wrestling and Sports Canada were helping out too. Like they're they're getting me the people that I need. They're getting this uh, helping me find um, nutritionists and sports sports psych and strength and conditioning that all like help me out with that and that's important right because you need you need everything like a full a full realm of people to uh, help you make make the make the olympics so yeah when, when i was there it was amazing and i knew i was wrestling uh, right at the end of the games right so i knew i had a lot of time to focus and train when we were down there so when we flew in it was great we flew in as a team we got there and, and and it's exciting, right? You're in Brazil and charter flight, like yeah, yeah, it was it was great. Um, you get there and you're in the village and there is a lot of like hurry up and wait. Like there's things you have to go through, a couple hoops. You have to get a room. You have to go and get your baggage. You have to do a lot of things. But it was it was all great processes, right? And yeah, we kind of just we knew we knew we weren't competing really soon, so we were kind of stress free, right? We were just there. And we went and we got all our stuff done. We did some media stuff. And then we, uh, Canada Wrestling decided that we would, like, leave the village. Like, this was, like, pre, pre-thought out. That we would leave the village and go to a different city for a week. So we didn't, we didn't have anyone compete until right at the end. So we went in. We did the village for two days or a day and a half. Did the opening ceremonies, which was awesome. Walked through as a team, as a country. And that was a great experience. Like I remember, I remember being there, and you walk through, and Canada is obviously one of the one of the first countries that goes through because they go alphabetical. And mm-hmm. we walk through, and we're all just standing there, and the crowd's humongous, and the people. But then it's like a lot of standing around, right? Like yeah, we have to wait for every country to come through, and how many? It was a lot. <laughs> it was a long wait. It was like a. The whole process was like a seven or eight hour thing. Like, Man, it's probably a mission trying to do that, and then also trying to like prepare for the con- I know the competition was still like yeah, a ways from like now, a lot of people like, a lot of people don't even go to the opening ceremonies just because some people's tournament starts before the games even start yeah you know I mean like the soccer tournament and the rugby tournaments like they start before the games so a lot of people don't have the opportunity to go to it man no when I was at Francophone games I had to miss it because I had the weigh in that day mm-hmm. But it's just like, man, I couldn't imagine missing it for the Olympics. Like, I was kind of upset about that, and it was Francophone yeah. Games. Like, yeah, but it's 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 not about that, right? It's it's about... Competing. Um, it's and about... That's what you're there. You're there for a reason. And it is nice when you can be a part of that and be a part of that um, opening ceremony and closing ceremonies. And um, I had been to two Commonwealth Games, two Pan Am Games, and I had never seen an opening and a closing. Some I've gone and net, not seen opening or closing. Just I went in. So that was your that. only experience? Um, I had seen... I seen the closing ceremonies at the Commonwealth Games before. Um, in India. I didn't see anything in, in, in um, Scotland at the Commonwealth Games. And I think that might have been my only one, yeah. Really? Um, so oh, was Pan it Am, just Pan Am Games actually in Toronto? I was I was able to do opening and closing because um, obviously it's close, right? I yeah. Was, we were in the like we went down before and then I came home. Like I only live. Like, and th- those are just away. regional ones. Like the Olympics, it's literally yeah. every country in the world, yeah, man. So it like was, it was intense, and I know a lot of people, like friends I had that are also Olympians. They they were doing their training camps, and like some. Some uh, sports won't even let their athletes, even if they had a week or two, they don't want them to, like, burn their legs out, you know what I mean? Like, if you're, like, a biker or something like that, and you you don't understand that it's, like, seven hours of, like, standing and walking. You get stiff and, yeah, and, like, and, like yeah. if it's not something you're used to, like, it could mess up your rhythm. And then, and if that's going to make a difference and you're competing, then why do it? But It's not worth it. Yeah. So we were pretty blessed for the timeline that we were right at the end and uh, we didn't have anything pressing so we were able to do the opening ceremonies and it was a great experience but the one thing I do remember is we're all standing around and after everyone walks through and it had been a long process and we're kind of, we were on such a high and then we just had like four hours of standing around and it kind of brings it down and then we started <laughs> like talking and then like when they lit the Olympic torch I was just like I was like this is real like this is real so I was like so jacked at that point it's like when I saw them light it, and I was just like, "Oh, I'm ready! Like I'm ready to like murder someone. I'm ready to kill. I'm ready to go." Oh, so that was like one of the most intense moments of my life, just because I had made it there and I'd like basically done everything you can do in this sport, 
So I made it there, and I was like, okay, I'm ready. I'm here for a reason. And then it was great. We, uh, we, left, uh, we left Rio, and we took a bus to uh, this city called Buzio's. And we had our training partners fly in and our support uh-huh. staff and everyone. We were at this resort, and it was amazing. Like, uh, when we were there, it was, it's the winter in uh, Brazil. So we were at, like, a summer resort. Yeah. It's the weather's still nice. It was still, like, 25 degrees. But Man, winter in a country like that is, like, yeah. perfect weather. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Like, you're not dying of heat at night, and you can still, like, go to the pool and stuff during the day. And, uh, yeah, we had everyone fly in, and, and the resort was, like, basically empty. There was a couple families there, but we had, like, the run of the place. And we had two mats set up in the, in the conference room. We had three meals a day, like, right there. So it was such a great atmosphere. We woke up, we trained, we ate, we chilled in the afternoon, we did a couple, like, team building things and then we like trained at night and it was just it such a, perfect. yeah it was yeah. such a good atmosphere and such a good positive place to be like leading up no stress no bad environment training partners were there you're not like oh i'm looking for a partner like everyone had a partner their size right like you had the person you were gonna wrestle every day so so you weren't stuck with like a 57 kilo no no no, no 57 <laughs> kilo guys for me but um yeah, so it was just it was it was a great atmos- atmosphere and it was like a great preparation. I really I'm really happy with how we did that. And then we were there for a week and then we made it back to uh made it back to the village and again like moving in and then kind of took a day off training and went in uh went in, like actually in s- experienced some of the Olympics. Went with my training partner and we went to a couple events and watched some uh, friends of our friends of mine that were competing and and that was awesome to see them and just see the whole experience and be involved in as like a spectator too right yeah and then the wrestling started and we were like into that right so that was good and then just kind of went and it was great experience watching like obviously erica weep win a gold medal and then me going out there and having a, a top eight finish and like my my family being there my friends and stuff like that seeing me and just yeah it was great experience man that's awesome man like i i just like I watch it and I get shivers, man, because I don't know, like, it just like the opening somewhere, like what you said, the torch and stuff, and like I, I couldn't imagine just being there and like seeing it, like I, when you said you you just felt jacked after like the, yeah, I, and it's, I know it's what you crazy. mean. Crazy, like, like I was just doing an event with uh, with RBC and uh, they had um, like a little little sneak peek at like the the next Olympics coming up, the 2018's ones in uh, South Korea. And it just, like, you see, like, those little clips of, like, people winning medals and the intensity of, like, the sport. And it just, like, gets you, like, what you're saying, like, gives you shivers, right? You yeah. just, because we're involved in that. Like, that's our life, right? And that's, like, that's what we hope for. Like, that's our end goal, like, standing on that podium, right? Yeah. When you see that, you're like, okay, I'm doing something. This is what I'm doing it for, right? Yeah, yeah. And I remember my first time, um... I met a guy named Kevin Rample. He's a sledge hockey player for uh, for the Paralympics, and he won a he won a medal at the 2014 Olympics. And I was at an event, and I uh, was talking to him, and he was telling me a story, and he has an amazing story. But um, he like let me hold his Olympic medal, and that was like the first time I'd like held medals before, but like I never hold held an Olympic medal. Yeah. And like I put it in my hand, and I was just like, it was like so heavy and like so like amazing just to yeah. hold it and hear his story and how he got there and how he won and i was just like okay this is what i want right yeah. and like sometimes when you're just having a crappy day you're like you think back and you're like okay if you can see it in your yeah, mind you can hold it in your yeah, hand yeah i know <laughs> and you're just like that's what you want and that's what it's about and there's like winning that world medal and winning that olympic medal like that's what people want and that's what we're fighting for so like man um it's crazy when you were telling me about your 2012 experience versus your 2016 experience because you were literally in the exact same position both times. And the second time, you obviously came through, right? And, like, explain to me, like, the contrast of both those situations. Like, that moment in the 2012 Olympics when you lost, like, did that, was that, like, the birth of, like, your journey kind of? Or, like, what... Like, explain to me when you think you really hit your peak. Was it when you beat Sonny Dinza at that Canada Cup? Or, like, like what was it that, like... Because I feel like I've seen you wrestle before, and, like, you are a great wrestler. And then I feel out of nowhere, it was just a, a shift to an even higher level 
like was it a mental switch or that's exactly what i was thinking like when you're talking it's a it's definitely a mental thing like i've always trained the same and obviously i've like being a big guy and in canada i've always struggled to have partners right like if i was 170 pounds i'd have a lot more guys at my size that are but i'm 265 pounds and yeah. there's not too many guys around you can't, you can't wrestle elvir <laughs> yeah so elvir shout out to elvir <laughs> So there's a lot of so there's a lot of guys uh, there's not a lot of guys for me to train and uh, I've always trained the same and I think that um, with with age comes maturity right and I just when I was younger if I thought back like if I trained different and had a different mental aspect of my training and and my preparation I think I would have had a more successful career younger yeah but I was like I was doubtful and sometimes I was like happy with with second place almost you know what I mean like mm-hmm. I was. I was not trying to strive for like the best in the world and it just it's hard to it's hard to put yourself in those shoes right as a, like as um as a kid from Elliott Lake right like I don't like it doesn't it's not in the realm of what it what what it could have been when I was younger when I was 14 years old and I started wrestling and I was out there like girls were pushing me down and stuff like that you know what I mean <laughs> so you don't you don't think like I can't imagine a girl pushing yeah, I know, me down like, <laughs> Like, Maybe I let them, you know, and <laughs> not work. But um, <laughs> but but it it wasn't it never was a thought on my mind, you know. And when when it does click, like you're saying, like it does click, you yeah. become like like a warrior. You become a fighter. You're like I'm fighting for a purpose now. Is that when you grew the beard too? Yeah. Well, it's it's been there and here. <laughs> yeah. So. No, 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 I feel you. I feel that, you. It's it becomes like. Yeah, everyone's like you can say, "Oh, I want to be Olympic champion," but actually, do believe it. Like yeah. that's what you got to do. You have to, you have to say it, and you have to believe it. And once your like mind believes it, then then you want it as bad as you think you want it. Yeah. So anyone anyone can say, like, "Oh, I want to be Olympic champ. I want to be this. I want to be this." But until you actually think it, you can you can say it all you want. But if until your mind says, "Okay, this is what I want," and then you're focused on that, that's when you're gonna start striving. That's when you're gonna go for those goals. And that's when it's gonna take some doubt out of your mind There's when you're when you're uh, when you're wrestling and you're like okay can I beat this guy you're like okay I'm gonna beat this guy yeah and because he's in my way of getting to where I want to be so that's what kind of switched to my mind and became just a harder fighter and a harder worker and I knew what I had to do to get to where I am and over the last five years I've I've felt like I've been mental strong and obviously there's always things I can improve on. And there's always things that I could do better, but yeah, that's it's a learning process, and that's where I'm at right now. With the next three years, I want to try to get as many opportunities as I can to work with the best guys in the world and the best coaches in the world. Yeah, I'm loyal to my club back in Guelph, and I'm loyal to my coaches, but if there's some coach down in the states or some coach in like Nova Scotia or PEI that like knows something that I need to know, yeah, I would love to work with them. Yeah, that's why I want to go to as many training camps, and I want to work with as many partners and bring as many guys as I can because I need those different feels and I need those different coaches and everyone sees wrestling different like if you watch it like everyone sees something different and mm-hmm. if they could teach you that one little thing that could help you get there then that's what I need to know right yeah no man 100% like um, especially man at the level you're at like you know like you know everything at this point but if it's like a certain feel that you can feel by training with a certain person or like a certain tip here or there like you gotta you gotta get that done like I feel like at this point you probably maximize everything you can get out of Guelph right um and obviously like it's your home and that's where you're gonna make the most progress in terms of peaking and stuff like that but it's just like in terms of like acquiring little things here and there to add to your arsenal like you gotta go to those different training camps and stuff right because it's just like man every country is a little bit different right so like they each have like a little bit yeah, and you got and you got to take some losses. Like when I'm at when I'm at home, I I know what I can I know what I can do to beat the guys in the room, and maybe doing that is not going to win me a world medal. Exactly. So when I'm even in my room, I'm trying to push myself and I'm trying to take people down on things that they're really good at defending. So yeah. if I know a guy is really really terrible at a single leg on the right side. I could take a single like a hundred times on him and, and yeah, win win that match at practice or score a hundred points at practice, but mm-hmm. that's not making me a better wrestler. Yeah. Being a better wrestler is taking something that I'm working on, some some underhook series or some head snap to a low single, like something like that, and work it on the guys at practice. Work it on the guys that I know that can defend it well. So that's that's where I'm at. And and getting out there and going to these training camps and getting guys that 
that can take me down. And, okay, he took me down on this thing, and next time he takes me down, I'm going to stuff him and I'm going to score off his shot, right? So that's what you got to do. you got to be put yourself in those situations where you're not the best in the room, and you gotta get you gotta get beat and you gotta get taken down, because if you don't get taken down, you're never gonna get used to it. And you're gonna when it t- takes time and you get when it takes it goes to the time where you when you need to win. Yeah. You you're gonna be up against a guy that can take you down, and you gotta be able to know how to deal with that. No, fair enough, man. So like pretty much your your mentality when you're in, in your home room in Guelph, you intentionally place constraints on the situation so that you can prepare yourself for a situation that's obviously more difficult when you're on the world stage or whatnot. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm always working on things. Like, I've had struggling. Because when, when I shoot in on a big guy, like, when I'm underneath, if I'm not in a perfect position, like, I'm going to get crushed. So yeah. I really focus on every time I take a shot, I'm getting that I'm getting that support leg up, and I'm driving in, and, and I'm, I'm taking more shots than I could. Like, usually, right, I'm, I'm pushing myself. Like, if I, if I wrestle a guy in practice, I'm, I'm taking trying to take... 10 shots in the three minute go I'm trying to trying to get underneath this guy and feel his weight and get strong underneath him every time so I can put myself in those bad positions but scoring from those bad positions yeah. so when I do get in those positions at, at a competition the world championships or Olympic games I know what I need to do and I know what I can fight from those positions fair enough man no, that's an awesome mentality um, but yeah going back to what you were saying about like you actually have to believe that you want to be like, you want to get that medal and stuff. Do you think you had to go through that experience in 2012 in order for you to realize that, or do you think that's something that can like someone can just have? I think I think you could just have that, but again, what I'm saying is like anyone can say it. Like you could say, okay, I want to be Olympic champion, but are you going to put the work in? Or are you going to put the time in? Do you actually think that's what you want? Yeah. So that I think that for me, that came with obviously some losses, right? Um, I was, sometimes I was so unsure of myself and sometimes I still have doubts, but, um, that comes with, for me, it came with time and it came with maturity. And once, once I knew that, and once I figured that out, my, that in my mind, I could train like to be an Olympic champion. That's when I knew I was ready. Right. Before, if I look back and I was like, Oh, I was young and I, I could have done things a lot different and maybe I didn't know I could have done things different, but looking back and that's what I tell the young guys on the team like like think about the mental aspect like try to be the best you can right now and and strive for the best and put in that extra work so I think it came it, for me it came with some losses and it came with some like hard times but I think that you could you can just be born with that you can just have that in your mind and just know that and sometimes it's got to be like driven into you your coach has got to tell you like you're the champion you're the best like no one's going to beat you yeah and yeah then you once like you that, be- that's like, what happened to mike tyson pretty yeah much, like once coach. you once you believe it and that's like the united states like that's a, that's a big thing they have like they they get these guys like these one-off guys like henry cejudo that was like comes from nowhere a young kid and just wins the olympic games and then like can't even make the national team anymore but at that time and at that moment he, he was told it. that he could be the best in the world, and he knew he could be the best in the world. Yeah. Back in the day, he, he, it was the rest of the, the worlds back then were, or you obviously knew them, it was uh, three two minute rounds, and you had to win best two out of three. Mm-hmm. He lost every first round at the Olympic Games. Seriously? And came back and won every match. I didn't even know that. Yeah, so like he was down and out every time. Like, so it was, was just sheer will. Yeah, and he just wanted it so bad, he went out and did it. Damn. And yeah, now it's just like that's happens. Like you see some guys of oh, different like, aspects, like some guys from the Russia, they go back and they win four or five times. It's just yeah, they're they're just freaks, right? Yeah, they're just freaks, man. And they're amazing wrestlers and they're just it's been bred into their into their country, into their, their culture, they right? Just wrestle out of the womb, honestly. Yeah, so like, and that's one thing that I think that Canada struggles with. We're probably five years behind um picking our our team so the guys that are being um put into high performance athletes are 18 19 20 years old right these guys that are like 12 13 14 years old in other countries are already being put into like high performance athlete program they're training like they're gonna win the olympic champ they'll be olympic champions so yeah I feel like we're a little bit behind on that. And it's just, it comes with success, right? Once we have success, there'll be more funding and there'll be more, there are more athletes that want to do it. So we are a bit behind and 
it does it does hinder us a bit, but we need to start looking at finding those athletes and getting them in the in the right rooms and getting them with the right coaches and getting them at the right competitions to make them think they can do it and once they think they can do it, they're gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. Just pick them out young, like instill instill the belief in them and stuff. No man, I agree, like you can say something, but like it only applies if you truly believe it. Like um, I don't, I don't, I don't know about like you, but I, I don't think that fake it till you make it um, mentality works for something that's tough, man. Like if you see like yeah. Muhammad Ali saying he's gonna be the greatest, it's because he actually believes he's gonna be the greatest, not because he's in, he's like trying to do some fake it till you make it crap. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's I, understand, just... I understand that too. And like you, you, you sometimes you have to like think that, and you have to like okay, I'm, I think I am, but but in your mind you don't even know, but. And some people could think, like, I'm Olympic champ, I'm Olympic champ, and, and never be there, never even make the world team, but everyone can't be the champion. There's only one winner, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, there's a ton of athletes out there that are, I'm going to be an Olympic champion, and they're fighting as hard as they can, and maybe they had a bad day and they didn't make it, but that's that's what, you can't you can't shoot them down for trying as hard as you want, as yeah. hard as they can. And that's what I say to the young guys on the team, like, I don't care if you're Olympic champion or world champion or national champion or CIS champion or OU sport champion, OUA champion, I don't care if you're fifth at the provincials. You go out there and you show me that that's the best you can be on that day. Like, what else could you ask for? Yeah. Everyone's not born to be the best in the world. Like, you can't just become this. You have to want it. You have to, like, go through the time and you have to be there and... There's there's a winner and there's a loser, right? And all you can do is is give your best. And for as a coach, like I'm not a coach, but I've helped out and I've mentored people. And you can't say, oh, you can't be mad at them if they if they lose. You can be mad at them if they didn't put in the work and they lost because they weren't ready. You can be mad at them if they um, slacked off or um, did something that you know they shouldn't do, but you can't be mad at them for going out there and trying their hardest. And at the end of the day, like, if they lost because the other guy was better at that, 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 that moment, that's all you can ask for, right? Yeah. No, fair enough, man. That's, yeah, just leave no stone unturned kind of mentality. Like, obviously, everyone has a specific potential, and you just got to fulfill that potential. So, but uh, anyways, man, tell me about, like, uh, like, your favorite national team experience. Like, was it the Olympics or was it, like, something else? Like, what's the craziest or, like, coolest story you have, like, traveling internationally? Like, what's, what's the coolest country you've been to? Well, or like, like, my... It's, it's, it's awesome to go. Like, I've been to so many countries. I've probably been to 25 countries in the world. But as you know, like, you've traveled with wrestling and you don't always get to experience the country, right? Yeah, I, I, tell, that, like, I tell people yeah, that, Yeah, like, oh, like, 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 oh, people, like, all these people come up, like, oh, you've been everywhere. And I have a map of my house and there's, like, pins all over it. And they're like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> you're so experienced. You're so traveled. I'm like, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time on a wrestling mat and in a hotel room. But <laughs> when we're there, we're there for a purpose, right? And I do wish I did explore a little bit more when I was younger and take a couple extra days. But obviously, I, I wasn't in the position. I didn't have the finances. And I also had a family. And you can't be, you can't be just going off and like exploring without your family or like that so yeah i wish i did a little bit more of that or had more opportunities to the games some... tournaments are better for those yeah right? so yeah. my probably my funnest experience was when i went to india and i did the commonwealth games one of my best friends was there with me we were both on the team both on the team and uh how it worked out like i they it was last minute right so i had no i had no plan and everyone before the, the games, like, knew the situation, right? They knew when they were wrestling. So they could kind of say, like, oh, I want to fly in this state or I want to come home this way. I want to stay for the whole game. So they could kind of pick, right? I didn't have the option because I, like, left literally, like, two days before. So there's, like, they booked a flight. And they're, like, okay, you're staying for a week and you're flying home, like, after you compete, right? So I'm, like, okay, whatever. I get my visa go. And the team before that, they, they flew out early and they went to Dubai and they saw this cool what? stuff. Yeah, and I was like, I was like, whatever. Like, I'm not here for that. It would have been yeah. an awesome opportunity. And the, like, they were all telling me about it. And they went like dune buggy and in the desert. And <laughs> they went and saw like crazy. These guys are getting ready to compete. Yeah, I know. And it, it was, they were actually training and doing stuff. Too. Okay, it was, okay. It was cool. They got some cool experiences, right? But, and then, uh, so my buddy, you obviously know Chris Brickett. He's assistant coach at Brock University now. He's a really good friend of mine. We were both on the team, 
and I fly in and like he meets me at like the front and we're like oh he's like oh it's amazing you're here so glad and we we both wrestle and he got third I got second and uh obviously like we're done competing right so we're kind of like on our own time and we're like in India and it's crazy we're in the village <laughs> and it, was, it was a crazy atmosphere right so I had like a day it's just a different to, world eh yeah so I did like a day to just do whatever and it was awesome and just you, you've been to the games and you meet so many different athletes right and it's just like it's semi a big party after after you're done yeah. competing. Like, there's some people that are still focused, but there's some people just like on their own time doing their own thing, and um, it's all sports, so, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's like you meet a great amount of people, and you know, within uh, with Commonwealth, there's a lot of countries that speak English, so you can meet a lot of people and Australians, New Zealands, like uh, Great Britain, all these athletes. So you meet a lot of people, and I still have friends from from there. And so how it worked out is I was supposed to leave like a day after I wrestled. I'm all packed, and uh, we go and talk to the travel agent was there, and they're like, is there any way I can stay? And he's like, no, like, there's no way. You're, like, leaving tonight. My, my flight, I was leaving the village at 11 o'clock, and we all had, like, little Nokia cell phones, and, because, like, just to stay in contact with each other, and yeah. everyone's, like, number was pre-programmed in, and so I was, I Chris, like... So you got those for the games? Yeah, just for the games, okay. just to, like, stay in contact when we were in there and kind of call back home a little bit if we if we needed to. But um, it's more like a safety precaution, right? If you're, like, getting a situation where you're, like, you need help, like, you call someone, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm walking from our, our tower to the bus to leave, and uh, my phone, like, this is, like, 11 o'clock at night, my phone rings, and it's the travel agent guy that's, like, staying at the villa, and he's like, Corey, we found you a flight. Like, it's, like, $200 to change. You can stay for another week. And I was like, awesome. Let's do yeah. it. <laughs> so I, like, went back. Gave him the credit for guard information. So I'm like, I'm staying in India with like one of my best friends for another week. And we're just like doing whatever we want. So we had a good time. Tearing up wrestling. villages. Yeah. So like, it was just awesome. Like we, it was a good story because like he was like legit walking me to the bus. I was about to go to the airport and he calls me like five minutes before I leave. And he's like, we got you a flight. You can stay. So I just like stayed and just, we had a great time and like met some people and just like still like in contact with like a bunch of people we met and. Yeah, it's, it was it was it was one of my favorite experiences because like going out into the, into India and like the culture there is like amazing. Yeah. and they love the wrestling, the sport of wrestling, and they respect it. So that's just like kind of being a semi like celebrity, right? It was it was a great time. That was one of my favorite trips. Man, that's crazy because like it's funny, man. Because people when they think of like favorite trips, they think it's gonna be in like some nice exotic like yeah, country yeah, we and went stuff, to, like, right? Paradise like, and with chills on the beach, but this was like. In the slums, it was like yeah. just seeing the culture and like, the actual the, authentic yeah. culture, we went, right? Like into this market, and there's like people like grabbing at you, like oh come by this and come take this taxi ride, and there's like stray dogs and it's just like crazy. How was it like? Um, Cause like obviously you're like you're a Caucasian guy, so you, when you're just like walking through like the villages and stuff, were people like astonished to see you and like uh, just like not really? They, because they knew the games were going on, right? Okay. So, like, they knew what was going on, but they, like, when they told us, they're like, oh, try not, if you go out, try not to wear, like, Canada stuff. When we go out, we're wearing full Canada gear. <laughs> full like, uniform. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, we don't care. And then we're, like, on the, we're on the subway going into town, and that was, like, I'm from a town of 9,000 people, right? Like, I've been to Toronto and stuff like that, and got on the subway there, but, like, the subway in India is next it's level. One billion people, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, next level. So you, like, get on, and it's just, like, the first train we walk in, they're like, we walk in, it's like empty. I'm like, oh, let's take this one. They're like, kick us out because it's the girl only train. Oh, shit. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we can't take this I one. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, they have like like cars that are like just for women. So that's cool. And uh, then they, we go out and it's just like, they're like pushing us in like sardines. It's like next level. And uh, yeah, so we get on and like people are like, they notice who we're, we're in Canada, right? And they're like, people are asking for autographs on the train and this and pictures. And it was just a good experience. And then we go into this, this market and people are like grabbing at us, like, come here, come here. And I was like, it was semi freaky, right? Cause like people we taking selfies. Yeah, like, we didn't know where we were and we didn't know what we were getting into. Right. And then just kind of, so you guys went to the vill- villages alone. eh? like, did you guys, yeah, were we you guys just, told like, to walk. get escorts and stuff, like police escorts, or like, every time we like traveled, like with the team, like going places, we'd always like have like three or four police like cars following us. But we just like went on our own. We Man, just, you're like, insane. Yeah, that's <laughs> just crazy. Went out and just did it, and it, it was a great experience. Yeah, and just and yeah, there was like temples we went to and checked them out, and just oh seriously, yeah, it was like went through some like ceremonies with them, and like they did some cool stuff with us. It was fun. 
Man, that's awesome. That sounds <laughs> that sounds like an adventure. Um, actually, one more thing I want to ask you about. Um, actually, so you had your rivalry with Sonny Dinza, right, in mm-hmm. Canada, and now he's in WWE. And like WWE, were they like trying to recruit you or something? Yeah. So I did. I uh, right after the Olympics, they had like um, they had like a scout at the Olympics, like checking out talent, and they okay. they reached out to me after, and they're like, come down. No strings attached, like nothing from us, nothing are you. Just come down, check it out, check our facility out, train with the guys a bit, see how the show runs, and we'll talk, right? So I'm like, free trip to Florida, why not? Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this. So, yeah, they booked it all for me, got there, got a rental car. And uh, so, yeah, Sonny was, Sonny was down there. He was, I didn't train with him because he was like kind of doing, they were doing like, there's like stages, right? So there's like beginner, intermediate, and like the big guys, right? And it's, wasn't like the WWE, it's their uh, NXT program, yeah. and that's like a Florida-only program, basically. They do branch out a bit, but yeah, it was cool to like, go and see how it worked, and there was a couple other wrestlers there, there was a guy from Brazil that like I knew, he was like one of the top guys from Brazil wrestling, but he's into this now, and yeah, it was cool. And it was, uh, I saw Sonny when I was down there and talked to him a bit. Did he get heated or? <laughs> no, 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 I didn't get heated, no, no. Man, how crazy would it be if, like, you went to the WWE and you guys still had the rivalry going yeah. in WWE, just like, I'm, I'm here, I'm back. Yeah, for sure, but yeah, there was, there was some pretty crazy athletes down there. There was another uh, wrestler from the States, he's a Greco guy, and uh, yeah, just like a short, jacked guy he was probably like i don't know five seven like 300 pounds just like wide as 300 pounds he was just like wide as a truck yeah he was a big thick dude he was like pushing off like i think he said he benched like 225 for 45 reps what yeah (laughs) he was just like a just a tank that's insane yeah there was some big dudes down there it was fun like to train and see how it works and like obviously you know it's like all choreographed right so it was cool to learn the basics because you don't even think of it but everyone like as w- if we were wrestling and we knew what we were doing like you kind of know exactly what the other person's going to do at all times because the way they the way they move they always move a certain way and they always like when you're doing one move you always go to the right and when you do another move you always go to the left so just learning that was cool yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and meeting a bunch of people and seeing how the show works and be behind the scenes and uh, Triple H is the one that runs that, so like hanging out with him, it was cool. yeah, that must have yeah. been awesome, man. It was a cool experience, but it just it was it wasn't it wasn't something that I was like super interested in because yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to move to full art full time. You have to commit to their program. It's a hectic lifestyle. Yeah, man. Like, and it is it's a busy like you're on the road like two hundred and something days a year, right? That's insane. Yeah, it's a lot, and for a guy with a kid, and and I'm still in my wrestling career. Like it's not for me. If I was like a if I was like a Sunny Denza and like. 20 year old guy and I was like oh throwing some money at me like why would I not right? yeah yeah so it's just a little different but yeah I hope Sonny does well I think he's doing pretty well in it he's uh, I right? think he's like a tag team champion or something yeah, him right yeah his buddy are tag team champions I think <laughs> Man, that's insane, man. That must have been... Cool. I've been, like, a... I was, like, a huge WWE fan when I'm here. I'm still, like, a WWE <laughs> fan. Like, I, I went to an, one of their events last year, like, Survivor Series. It, it's pretty cool, man. Like, I was... Yeah. But, uh, anyways, man. Yeah, like, that That sounds awesome, man. Uh, I think we've actually reached our time limit for the podcast. I, do you know uh, what, what time we're at, Vid? Uh, 20 minutes of the second video. So, like, around almost an hour. An hour mark, yeah. So, I think we're... We've reached around the hour mark, man. But, man, thank you so much for yeah, coming no down problem, to this happy podcast. It came out. Yeah, man, like, awesome first guest. Like, I, I felt like you would be, like, the best first guest, right? So, um, yeah. So, this, w- this has been the first episode of the Battling Basic podcast. Um, we're going to be releasing these every Sunday. Um, if you want to, like, listen to it on your way to work Monday morning or whatnot. But, uh, yeah, tune in next week. We'll have another episode up as well. Um, and again, thank you to Corey Jarvis. If you guys want to follow Corey Jarvis on social media, I'll, I'll make sure to get your social media after. I'll uh, edit it into the video or put it in the description. Um, and then, yeah, you guys can uh, have insight on Corey and his future endeavors as well. Check so, that Snapchat out, you know? Yeah, cooking with Corey. <laughs>